Kuzampula and good afternoon to everyone here. My name is Sanam Tenzin Wangchuk. I am from Bhutan. And today I will be co hosting the panel uh, entitled In Conversation with the Three Idiots. So, first of all, let's introduce our first panelist, Mr. Abhijat Joshi. Mr. Abhijat Joshi is a world renowned playwright and screenwriter from India whose movies revolving around deep social themes has sparked nationwide debate and inspired a new generation of change makers. One of his most One of his most prolific movies, Three Idiots, has even inspired the very name of this panel. All of his accolades and his awards are testimony to his genius, and yet he maintains a wonderful aura of warmth and humility. Let's move on to our second panelist. Our second panelist is Ms. Sandy Spiker a partner at the global design and innovation firm, IDEO. She serves as the managing director of the education practice, and she is an optimistic design thinker who works to meet people's unmet needs. She has helped to improve the school systems in several countries, such as India, Peru, and Brazil. She works to nurture the creative energy that is latent in both students and teachers. And now we come to our third panelist, Ms. Dr. Huang Mei Shu. Dr. Mei, nicknamed the former Zan Black Bear Mama, is one of the is the Dean of the Institute of Wildlife Conservation at the National Ping Tung University of Science and Technology. She is an enthusiastic conservationist with a passion for preserving wildlife by promoting cooperation between domestic and international organizations. She is also known for establishing the first NGO in 2009 which focuses on conserving the Formosan black bear. Through her work, she hopes to inspire more of the younger generation to commit to conservation. And of course, finally, we have my mentor and also my first girlfriend. Don't tell anyone this. Ms. Kiran Birsethi. She's... The most important uh, introduction is I'm his first girlfriend. <laughs> uh, she's a prodigy in the field of education. No one's going to disagree here. In 2009, she initiated the Design for Change process, which is now the world's largest movement of change by and of the children. She received the Light of Freedom Award, the Excellence in Instructional Leadership Award, and a myriad others that one cannot even begin to name. Also recently, she even met with Pope Francis and got him to sign about half a million Catholic schools under his purview. Talk about the that I can spirit. Get it? Uh, but now, on a, more, a little bit more of a serious note, before we continue the panel, I'd like to uh, honor the sacredness of this time and place by inviting all of you to join me on a meditation. It's a very short meditation. It'll take around 30 seconds. So may I please ask everyone to follow my instructions? Thank you. Keep your hands on your knees. Your back straight, shoulders back, and your tummy is relaxed. Keep your mouth slightly ajar to allow you to breathe. And now for the next 30 seconds, I would like to ask everyone here to focus only on their breath. The feeling of the air coming in 
and going out. I would like everyone to start this for the next 30 seconds as soon as I ring this bell. And our meditation will begin now. Thank you all so much for your cooperation. Does everybody have a mic? Oh, no, you didn't introduce yourself. Huh? You didn't introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm just introducing all these great people. I forget someone as small as I. Uh, so my name is Sonam Tenzin Wong Chuk. I'm a grade 9 student, and I'm from DFC Bhutan team. Where are you at? Now I'll be co-hosting this panel, so thank you all for your cooperation. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are really, really honored to have the three of you, um, even though you're called idiots. <laughs> but I think uh, there is no greater panel that we would like to um, have share insights and your um, just your wisdom. I think it's always wonderful to listen to people who have lived experience. So uh, we're delighted, Sonam and me, uh, to be able to take you through the next hour and a half. Uh, the masterclass will work in a couple of uh, sort of uh, sections. One is, of course, just a preliminary warm up question that we will have. The second is we will have personal questions for each of the panelists on the work you do. Uh, then we will have a, um, a question or two which we would love all of you to share your insights on. And then, of course, we cannot end without a rapid fire. So we will have a little fun rapid fire asking you completely embarrassing questions. And then, of course, we will open it up to the audience, so feel free uh, to write down your questions that you might have through uh, the next hour and you will send it to us and we will make sure that we will, uh, we will answer as many as we can. Uh, so, Sonam, are we ready? Yes, sir. And regarding the questions, just please use your phone to scan the QR co code here and send your questions through that. So, uh, if we can, we'll ask your question during the audience round. So, thank you. Are we ready, Masterclass? Okay. Okay. Sonam? So let's start. Uh, the first question. This, did you all look forward to going to school and what made it memorable? And these are your short questions. Yeah. <laughs> Warm up. <laughs> yes, so we can just start uh, with, with, in that order. No, I didn't look forward to going to my school, though I had a great principal, Dr. Himmat Kapasi. Uh, but in spite of his trying, the system was so rotten that I never enjoyed school. Uh, I wish I had a school like uh, Kiran. I think she runs the best school in the world. But uh, if I had gone to a school like that, I would never have been able to write Three Idiots. <laughs> so basically, your bad schooling helped you uh, write Three Idiots. So good for that. I did like going to school. Um, I grew up in New York, in America. And um, I went to a public school in my town. Can we have it closer to you? Oh, sure. Yes. Better? Yes. Um, I, and I, I really liked going to school. I, I, I'm, I just, what else would I, was I going to do with my day? It was like a lot to be inspired by and excited by and curious about. So I really enjoyed it. My turn. Um, if you don't mind, because most of the audience are come from Taiwan, so probably it's easier for me to use Mandarin. Sure. 
，OK。我不是很清楚，啊、呃，我我不是很清楚我会不会想再去学校，因为学校非常的刻板，除了考试、念书之外，好像还是考试。起码我是这样长大的，直到我去美国念博士班，我对学习有新的看法。所以，如果我喜欢念书的话，应该是喜欢念我的研究所。因为系统不一样。是啊。呃 ，another quick question to ask you here is、um, any teacher? I mean, I think because the audience, just to let you know, is primarily teachers from Taiwan, parents, and of course our Design for Change partners. So we we trying to kind of keep the emphasis and the insights、uh, so that it kind of really influences the way we can leave、uh, the master class. Thinking slightly different, you're thinking like idiots, right? So、uh, the question again to the three of you, and we can start with May. We will start with you first. Is any lesson or teacher that left an impact, good or bad, during your time in school? Um, 我喜欢上学的原因其实也是遇到好老师，所以最影响最大的应该是我在美国明尼苏达州念博士的老师。那他教我用科学的、严谨的方式去独立批判。我在学校系统里里面第一次，或者比较严肃，有人问我 “How do you think？” 你觉得怎么样？他持续的在挑战我，你有什么想法？那这个是我印象最深刻的老师，他教我什么叫独立批判思考。You know, when you work in education,、um, this question comes up a lot. You know, a favorite teacher.、Uh, I'm sure you've all answered this or thought about it many times.、Uh, and I always answer the same person. Her name is Miss Illig, and she was、um, like an enrichment teacher that I had in when I was 10, and a few years kind of around that. And the reason she always stands out to me is、um, the focus of her teaching was always about kind of helping us see each of ourselves as creative people. Um, which of course made me love the environment that I got to learn in. But the most memorable interaction I had with her was when I kind of phoned it in on an assignment, and、um, she called me on it. And she pulled me aside and she said, "This isn't what you do. Why is this happening?" And、um, I will never forget that、um, because what she did always was ask us to rise to all that we could be. Well,、uh, the greatest teacher I met in my life was not at school, but at the age of 13, I was luckily introduced to who I consider to be the greatest human being I've met in my life.、Uh, his name was Mr. Amte,、uh, Murli Dhar Amte, and、uh, I was taken to meet him、uh, at a sort of a sanctuary that he had created for leprosy patients, and leprosy was considered to be A disease that had to be shunned in those days, and he had embraced leprosy patients. But he came from a strange background. He was a great poet in Marathi language. He was a racing car driver. He was a wrestler. He was a film critic. He had made friends with Greta Garbo and Norma Shearer <coughs> in his days. And then one day he had left all of that to uh, become uh, a, a humble servant of.、Uh, These patients, and、uh, his motto was give them opportunity, not charity. So he was fighting with them to create a sort of a self-sufficient world where they were building their own houses, growing oranges in Nagpur, and selling them. And I could, he passed away、uh, 15 years ago, but I continue to learn from his lessons and life till this day. Wow, yeah, I think、uh, what's、uh, remarkable is that whether we like it or not, the work we do as teachers will leave a mark. Good, bad, or ugly is up to us, but it does impact the heart and the mind of a child. And I think if we don't take that responsibility very seriously and very sacredly, we can end up doing far more damage than good. So thank you for sharing your teachers as well, Sonam. Okay, so this is the last short question before we move on to the more meaty、One、matters.、Minute.
Uh, what's one word you would use to describe yourself at 14? Uh, suffocated. You know, he just said, Open, keep your mouth slightly ajar to lead uh, breath in and breath out. I felt suffocated. That was not happening because of the system that I was in in the school. Um, you know, it's hard for me to describe myself, but I can say what um, I used to be called like um, spark plug. Like, uh, because I would often kind of be a catalyzer in a room of conversation, so go with the spark plug. Right? Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, again, to keep referring back to the idea that there has been a global study that says that most children have very negative experiences in the growing up years. And it's doing far more damage much later on. I don't think a country or humanity can <coughs> suffer the outcome of a childhood that goes unprepared uh, and unresolved. So uh, I, I would like to keep asking you to think about just the insights that we're hearing. So a uh, global study shared that the primary feeling that children had in school was probably not suffocating, but disinterested and cynical. And that's a real worry, that if I believe that nothing's going to change, nothing's going to happen, we can't get children not feeling optimistic about life, so uh, about what their future can be. So I think in many ways, education plays a role in planting the seeds of optimism. So again, thank you for that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, warm up happened. Now we are coming to the serious part. How many in the audience have seen the film Three Idiots? No, oh, okay. Abhija, that's pretty much 99.7%. Right, the point three are only the ones from Bhutan. <laughs> no. Okay, so obviously Abhijat, since a lot of them have come with the background of three idiots, it's only fair to ask you the first question. Three idiots has of course been a massive game changer, right? In the field of education, it provided a glimpse of what education can be. Uh, I have to tell you, of course, in all honesty, the first two months after three idiots, everybody wanted to change the system. And then after that, everybody went back to being exactly the same. Yeah, so, but having said that, I think uh, the question we want to ask is, what was that catalyst? What was that spark that got you to write such a brave movie? Uh, before I answer that, I'll have to start uh, with some thanks, because it's unbelievable to see this reaction, you know, when I see so many hands raised, I just feel grateful <laughs> that so many people have seen a movie that we wrote. Uh, we started writing it in 2006, uh, October, finished it in 2009, and it's been uh, nine years since the movie came out. And so many of you have seen it and loved it. That's the greatest honor. So I'm so glad to be sitting here and witnessing this. It's a privilege that is denied to far greater artists than I am. Uh, so thank you for uh, watching the movie and being enthusiastic about it. Uh, thank you, Kate, and your amazing team. You are amazing, your team is amazing, incredible. So thank you for getting me over to be able to see this. Thank you, Kiran. I'm forever grateful to you. Uh, I'm your biggest fan in the world, you know that, uh, except maybe uh, Sonam. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, last but not the least, I want to thank the translators, you know, who are simultaneously translating and doing such a great job of it. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I know it's a difficult art because I do the subtitles of the film after it is over. And I know how tough it is, you know. 
Uh, yeah, it reminds me, uh, once in my city, Ahmedabad, an English officer was retiring from a mill. And he, in his retirement speech, he told a joke in English. And the workers didn't understand English, so there was a translator translating this. And he told a joke which was a subtle English joke. It went on for about four minutes. And uh, the translator then had the task of translating it. And he translated it immediately in one sentence. And people cracked up. And uh, this English gentleman was amazed. He said, how did you do that? You're a genius. He said, I just said that the English one has cracked the joke, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm sure you guys are not doing that. <laughs> Thank you. So, so that's my heartfelt thanks to everyone. Uh, about three idiots. Uh, you know, it started uh, with a book that uh, a gentleman named Chetan Bhagat had written named Five Point Someone. And uh, the director, Rajkumar Hirani, wanted to make a movie not on, based on that book, but triggered from that book, because the book was sort of anecdotal in nature about three engineers uh, in a college and uh, th three engineering students. But uh, we wanted to do, we wanted to build on that and do something much more than that. So we took it as a starting, starting point and then started running. So as I said, it took about three years to write the film. And the biggest breakthrough came in the, about the first month when I remembered a meeting that had happened 11 years before that, in 1996, on the set of a movie uh, called Karib, and that movie had flopped. But it gave me the idea uh, for Three Idiots, in a way. Because I was introduced to a person by a lady, and that lady was Renu Saluja, the greatest editor in the history of Indian cinema. And she took me to meet a gentleman and she said that, you know, this man was with us at film school for four years, but we knew him by a different name. I said, how did that happen? So she said that someone else from his village got admitted in the film school. <laughs> he had appeared for an exam and uh, passed that exam and got the admission. <laughs> And in 1977, there were no IDs in India. Uh, so he had got the admission, but then he wanted to join his father's business, so he didn't want to go to film school. So another boy from that village, he said, hey, you're not using your uh, admission? Give that to me. <laughs> so he just borrowed that admission letter and showed up at the film school in 1977. And it's that, at that time, it was the only film school in India in Pune. And so for four years, this gentleman lived, studied in that school under the other guy's name. So when I heard the story, I was amazed. I said that, well, that's very interesting, but there's a problem that at the end of the four years, there would be a diploma, a degree which would be handed out. And that would be in the name of the other gentleman. So that degree would be useless to this man. To which Renu replied, my friend, she gave this answer. She said, he was seeking education, not a degree. Oh, okay. and, and that was the beginning of Three Idiots. Wow. That was the seed. Wow, man's a beast. Okay. So, I think everyone here after watching The Three Idiots really wants to know because you've written your characters so well that they're so different, their personalities. So which of The Three Idiots do you most relate to? <laughs> Why? Uh, see, in my formative years, so when I was going to school, in college, things changed because uh, from science, where I was a misfit, I was doing reasonably well, so I was, uh, you know, like everyone else, I was pursuing that, but I was like, fish out of water. So at that time, uh, and all the things that uh, we have uh, described in Three Idiots, you know, learning through, sorry, all the things that we have described in Three Idiots, like learning through rote, uh, you know, tremendous pressure, 
uh, being fearful all the time, all those things I experienced. So in that sense, uh, I identified with the characters of Farhan and Raju. One guy was a misfit, you know, he was in a wrong profession. The other guy was terrified all the time. You know, he was, a, he was tremendously fearful till Rancho came along and sort of rescued them both uh, from that kind of existence. So those are the two characters that I uh, related uh, in, my, in my formative years. Later on, uh, as I grew out of these shackles, I cannot say I ever became Rancho. No, I did not. But the kind of people that I'd met in my life, like I mentioned Mr. Amte, uh, the Maxisi Award uh, winning man, a, a great uh, man doing work for leprosy patients, and many others that I came across. They had these qualities that Rancho possessed, of being a free thinker, uh, you know, valuing education over training, valuing uh, communication over jargon. Uh, these are the things that I witnessed in them. And I borrowed for uh, this character from their personalities. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm going to keep kind of grounding it back into the idea of stories. And once I remember you telling us that somebody asked you, where do you get your stories from? And you said that every experience plants a story into your body. And I keep saying the body becomes a repository of stories. Right? It, you, you have your, your, your skin, your body, your mind, your heart are all vessels of stories. Very often in education, over the 15 years that our children stay in school, they don't have stories. Uh, they're not gifted stories. And I think it's so important for our role is not just the teaching, but the planting of these stories and to have those experiences that the body can then, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, be a vessel of. So, Again, thank you uh, for that, uh, that moment. Okay, for Sandy? Okay, so Ms. Sandy, design thinking nowadays is like a very cool idea. It's very hip. But many people, they misunderstand it because when we think of the word design, we think products, we think like things. So how do you, what is your interpretation of design with regards to education? So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm curious too, how many people in this room know the word design? Oh. Okay, just about as, as many as the saw the movie movies. Three Idiots. Almost as many people who <laughs> <Yeah>. know design. <laughs> <laughs> close, close enough. Um, and how about the term design thinking? Because I think that one's, that one's a little harder. So. Um, Maybe I can, I can just give you some context. So I'm a professional version of Design for Change. That's what I get to do every day um, for a living. And um, uh, people ask us all the time about design thinking because it seems like this big thing that is some new profession, new, thank you for new hot profession, yes. Um, but I always feel like that makes it kind of intimidating. Um, as if it's like a proper noun that you have to fully understand and it sounds cryptic. Um, I like to abstract it then a little bit to say it's the idea of design thinking is, is really about thinking and acting like a designer. Mm. How do you orient in the world like a designer? What is a designer? Well, a designer is somebody who is making something, making decisions about how to make the world better. So if you're thinking and acting like a designer, you're kind of wondering, what's the current state of the world? How are you feeling? What's your pain? Are you suff you're suffocating? We need to fix something, right? And a designer is also thinking, how can I make that better? Oh my gosh, you're suffocating in school. We don't want schools. We have made every decision, everything we experience in schools is the result of a design decision that we made. The buildings, our classrooms, the curriculum, the spaces, every interaction we're designing, they're choices that we're making. And we can make those choices better if we understand people. And so that first step, feel, is so much about what do other people experience so that I understand their world, not just mine, but their world too. And that imagining is really about saying we have 
all kinds of choices about how we live and how we spend our days. And if it's not working for us, we can make it better. And the only way we can make it better is by seeing that future differently. And that's where our imagination comes in. We have to be able to take a leap and see the world differently. And then, of course, the do step about doing something about it. Um, and then what I love is that the share back, right? So that we're not just making the world, but we're actually talking about what it took to do that. So that we're all in that dialogue together. Now, I know that was a kind of deviation from your real question about design, because of course it's really easy for us to think, if something can drop on the ground, it was designed, right? This thing here has been designed by somebody, yes. But so have all of the systems that we live in. So our governments are designing all of the time the world that we live in. Our um, healthcare is designed. Our education systems are designed. And so we can use the same kind of thinking, the same kind of imagination, the same kind of empathy to redesign our systems too. So I think, uh, and, I, and again, kind of came anchoring back to, uh, so that um, the audience here kind of understands it also. I think what, and, and this is what I think so much of education has been always struggling with, or actually more interested in, is what I might say, is what to teach and how to teach it. So our effort and our interest seems to be, give me a better way to teach quadratic equation, or you know, do this. I think what you're saying is, if we don't focus on the who and the why, then the what and the how doesn't really serve its purpose. Right. So I think the That's shift right. really is that the who, that is the user, and the why, that is the relevance, will drive and inform the what and the how. Yeah. Right? So I think, uh, and I think that's the shift that even in education we should keep going back to who is the child? What does it mean to love our children? Yeah. Right? So I think that's, uh, so that, that's really... And, and maybe I can just build on that a little bit because that's really well said, obviously, since, you know, Kieran does this for a living too. <laughs> um, but um, there's a thing I want you all to hold is you can be thinking all the time about children and how you're best serving and supporting them while you can also be recognizing that you as a teacher are also a designer. And that isn't just about teaching them to have that um, belief in themselves, to have those methods, uh, to have that mindset. That's about you being able to use that every day as well. And if you know yourself that way, you will help them become that no matter what. So in a certain way, it's almost more important that you find in you what design means. Because once you know that, you're a teacher. You won't be able to stop yourself from helping the children see that in themselves. That's the contagious spirit. The contagious spirit. <laughs> Thank you. May, a very interesting question for you. Whenever I have met people, I've often asked them, who has inspired you? Or who do you get inspired by? And like uh, uh, Abhijat and like Sandy said, they've been inspired by either people or for me, I often refer to Mahatma Gandhi as being uh, uh, an inspirational figure. Well, that's only for us mere mortals, right? I mean, we have people that we get inspired by. But you mentioned to me earlier that you were really inspired by the bears and that they had taught you many lessons about who we can be as people. So can you please share with us as an audience that your inspiration from nature and uh, what it talked to you about humanity? Sure. Um, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <这有点作弊了。如果不是台湾人的话。笑> 那唯独在台湾它其实是濒临绝种的动物那大部分的研究都会在森林里面那这么一做其实就是二十年所以我其实也
，刚刚一听下来，其实听到我的学校教育，其实也跟在座的台台湾人应该半斤八两，都是这样子填鸭长大的。所以我怎么会这么独特的走向做熊的研究，其实是蛮好笑的。其实很简单，我后来发现都有它的原因，是因为我我很喜欢自然。如果有人问我我的小我的过往最快乐的一段时光是什么时候，我会说，那个大家在拿幼稚园毕业证书的时候，我没有毕业，这是我唯一没有拿到的一张文凭，我还蛮遗憾的。我的童年很贫穷，但是非常快乐，因为我都在乡下田里面长大，这个跟自然的连接。成就了我后来会走向保育生物学的领域。那因为喜欢山上，因为喜欢森林，所以我选择了生物系。那也因为研究黑熊，更让我发现，更让我发现，好像不继续做也不行。这个有一点叫做中国人说的“走火入魔”，如果用英文来讲，叫做 “patient”。那会有这样的情况，其实主要我发现我的研究对象已经日落西山之余，快要绝种了，有一半依然断手断脚，是因为非法现行所导致。我也发现我们现在的社会非常的功利主义，选举刚过，全部的竞选员都说我要让你发财，我要让你有钱，可是有钱之后。我们有比较幸福吗？我的黑熊研究让我知道，人其实只是这地球的一一个分子而已。所以我今天早上听很多各国的小朋友分享，他们因为有感受，看到垃圾堆积如山，看到环境被破坏了，他们就执行一些小小的任务。我很感动，因为那个叫有感。所以。如何有感，接下来采取行动，其实也是我从事黑熊研究，黑熊教我的。因为我本来只想在森林里面好好清淡的过日子，看看鸟啊，听看看森林啊，吹吹风啊，做起看云石就好了。可是发现状况很糟，因此，因为我看到问题了，所以我想解决问题。那其实跟这个。Design for change 的概念其实非常一样，所以如果你说黑熊有教我什么课程，我其实要说的是，我最大的教室在自然，就是我们所说的司法自然。只可惜现在人跟自然越来越脱节了。你多久没爬树了？你长大到现在，你爬过树吗？没有爬过爬过树的举手，啊，还不错嘛，吼。我们其实跟自然很脱节，那因此我们对环境发生很多事情都变得无感，甚至连黑熊也无感，甚至连云豹不见了，我们也都无感。所以，如果黑熊真的教有教我什么事的话，我其实只学到一件事情：应该施法自然，回到人到底为什么会为为人，就是人性的那一块。所以，有钱真的会比让人比较幸福吗？还是我们应该问，我们为什么跟其他动物不一样？所以教的好像有点是哲学的课，不是科学的课。谢谢。Yeah. I think you make uh, uh, an important um, uh, um, insight today, saying that Mother Nature can shape human nature, right? And I think that's so important because I think the idea of us planting the seeds of empathy can actually come. From nature, and these are choices. Like you said, we make as designers, we make choices.、Uh, can we choose to be empathetic? Can we choose today to be kinder, to be a little more generous of spirit? Right. So I think these are.、Um, so、uh, nature teaches so much whether we can become more humane. So thank you for that, May.、Um, just in interest of time, I would like for us to know,、uh, Kate.、Uh, just let us know when we have. Half an hour more, because I'd like to then、uh, open it up to the audience. So just、uh, let us know that. Yes, Sonam. So we can. Okay. So as this panel goes along, we're learning about nature, design, and even Mam Kiran said it best when she said that stories shape us. When we listen to stories, it shapes who we are. So my question to you is: in your respective professions, 
How do you think telling stories, sharing stories, listening to stories affects empathy? Like, how do you think it changes you? Can you like share an anecdote or like a short story about this? Now you understand why I'm his first girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think as human beings, it's an instinct to share stories. <clears throat> you know, we are, from thousands of years, people have done that. And we are grateful to people in the past who have recorded these stories, either in the oral tradition or in some written form. And the stories have continued. And Human beings don't let great stories die, you know. Uh, they float onwards. So that is an instinct. And in my profession, at least, it's, it's everything, you know. Like, so my whole life is listening to stories, telling stories, finding triggers for my movies from uh, stories in real life. Like, uh, one episode I shared about uh, uh, how three idiots came into being, you know. Uh, in, in that movie, there is a scene uh, where, if you remember, Rancho gives the definition of a book. You know, he gives the most involved uh, instruments that record, analyze, debate, knowledge, etc., etc. Et it's a very involved and convoluted definition of a simple thing, right? Now, I'll, I'll quickly tell you uh, the story from which this idea came. Uh, the director, Rajkumar Hirani, his son, was uh, studying, his, uh, studying for his exams. And we saw that he was uh, learning something by rote, that he was talking about a religious festival, and he was saying that it is celebrated to uh, commemorate the resurrection of <laughs> Jesus Christ. So I just asked him, do you know what commemorate and resurrection means? He said, no, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, he was very little at that time, okay? Now he's a wonderful young man. And he, I said that, okay, so Raju started telling him, let me explain this to you. He said, no, 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 no. If I don't li write like this, I won't get uh, good grades. You know, my uh, numbers that I'll get will be very less. And both of us looked at each other because we were writing Three Idiots at that time, and right there was an example of how a system can actually uh, scare someone into not caring about understanding something or learning something, but just being obsessed with the results. So we immediately used that as a trigger and came up with this definition of book in the machine scene. And I've done this pretty much all my life. Like the most recent film that I wrote, Sanju, uh, I was in doubt for a long time whether I should be writing that movie or not, because it was about a controversial uh, person. You know, he's a, a star of uh, Indian cinema, but he was uh, sent to jail for an illegal possession of uh, an AK-56 rifle. And he had a long history of drugs, etc., among other vices. So uh, we were finding the story to be very fascinating but didn't know whether to actually write that as a movie. And when you commit to a movie, you're pretty much uh, giving three years of your life. But then one day, while he was discussing his life with us, he told us one story. He said that uh, when his mother died, he was in the hospital, he was doing drugs so intensely at that time that even in the hospital, he could not stay away from drugs. So even at the time of his mother's last moments, he had promised his dad that he'll not touch drugs, but he couldn't help it. And he injected himself with a very heavy dose of cocaine. And that's when his mother, who, has been, who was in coma for a long time, she opened her eyes, summoned him, you know, with her she was too feeble to speak, but just with a, her hand gesture, she asked him to come closer. And he went closer and she touched his forehead and then her hand dropped and she passed away. And he told us this and then took a long pause and he said, but you know what? Till date, and this was 30 years ago, he said, till date I don't know 
whether that really happened or I hallucinated because I was under drugs. And the moment he told us this, we knew for sure that we were writing this movie. That anecdote had that kind of a power that we were so moved, we were so appalled, aghast, everything, and moved that he was sharing this in this manner that there and then we decided that this movie has to be written and executed. So stories are absolutely everything for me. It's kind of hard to follow that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was a really beautiful story, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just, I, uh, when you first asked that question, I actually thought about it um, from quite a different angle. Um, I was thinking about this, not just the stories we tell, but the stories that we're carrying and how often every situation we're in, we're creating our own story of what's happening. We're interpreting it. And how often that story we think is truth. And I was thinking just about how the, the other day, I had a, in my head, I had a fight with someone that I work with. And I had this whole story in my head about what she had done, what her motivations were, what, you know, what it all, what, what this situation meant. And, you know, I was mad for a long time. And then I sat down with her and we had breakfast and I started talking to her as if that were true. And I realized as we were talking that she was n confused, like she didn't understand what I was saying to her. And finally I just paused and I said, what do you think happened? And then she shared with me her story that had nothing to do with mine, right? But we were both holding this against each other for the week. And um, so when you ask this, you know, of, of course our, our bodies are engaged when we hear stories, but actually our bodies are creating stories. Yeah. And we often keep them quiet, either because we're shy of them or because we believe that they're universal, that everybody's having the same experience. And with your question, it made me wonder, what if we started asking more often, what's the story in your head about this? What if in our classrooms, when we're sharing, when we're exploring a topic, we said, well, how do you all hear this? How does this land with your life experience? What do you believe might have happened? I bet we'd hear 30 different stories back. And so I feel like that could be used a lot more often. Okay. 这个问题好像到我这边已经有点复杂了，以至于我也不知道怎么回答才好。<笑>嗯，我一直很喜欢科学，因为科学用非常严谨的方式在讲故事，<笑>所以我一直也不擅长讲故事。那这是我喜欢科学的原因，因为我学到科学是一分证据说一分话。但是我也慢慢发现。当我去学校或者面对大众要演讲的时候，在传递讯息的时候，只有故事最能够打动人心，因为故事充满的是非常完整、非常富有能量的生命经验。所以，嗯，我也在写我的故事。所以，如果回到原来的主题，我只能说，在教学设计的时候，我也希望我的学生。他能够写他的故事，我有点有点没有办法答，有点答非所问哈。OK。No。OK, I, I'm good, right? I I think you you absolutely nailed it when you said a story reaches your heart, <laughs> and you. science probably reaches the mind. Uh, so I think, um, and I think I keep saying this, and I come back to education about storytelling. I think we say so much of it when the children are young, and as they grow older, we think we have to become serious. Oh, stories are for children, but life is for adults. And, 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 and we forget that we are stories, like you said, and, and all of us uh, are a living story. Uh, somebody is a short story, somebody is a never-ending story, somebody is a blockbuster, whatever, right? So I think if we just look at this, this is probably a living library. And right here, there are stories sitting here, each one to be read. And, and I think it's such a powerful way to look at our children that way. If we looked at them as stories rather than as numbers or as grades or as just students. And imagine uncovering each chapter or asking the, the right different endings 
what, what a powerful way to look at uh, a, a, a great um, a, a narrative with children. In the interest of time now, of course, we want to leave it open for uh, the um, audience. But we, of course, have to end with a rapid fire before we, uh, we open it up to audience. So, Sonam, would you like to have the first? Now, remember, this is, uh, will be for May, then Abhijat, then Sandy, then Abhijat, May, and Sandy. So, okay. quickly, don't think twice. It's a rapid fire. Okay, so, Miss May, what was the last movie, TV show, or book that made you cry? <laughs> Quickly. Quickly. Rapid fire. Ah, difficult. Oh, 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 <laughs> okay, <I'll>, you send <laughs> Okay, Sandy, what is the hardest emotion for you to express? Oh, yeah, oh, oh, oh. I was prepping for the movie. No, 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 another one. <laughs> Can I just say, I watched Crazy Rich Asians on the plane coming out here and totally cried <laughs> because I was on a plane. All right, so I had to answer the last question because yeah. I'm clearly avoiding. The emotional question. No, no, emotion, emotion. So I'll just say, maybe vulnerability is the hardest thing for me to express, ah, maybe, since okay. I yeah. avoided the question. Sure, sure. Okay. For Abhijat. Uh, Mr. Abhijat, when you release a movie, do you prefer it being a box office hit or do you prefer critical acclaim? First, I'll answer the, the which movie has made me cry the most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheating on this exam. I'm going to pull it all You know, there are many movies that have made me emotional and I've cried. But w there was only one that has made me cry for months. And that is the first film that I ever wrote. And it bombed so badly <laughs> oh that I cried for many months. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but box office uh, okay. hit or critical acclaim? Uh, yeah, wait, you know, neither. No, 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 no. Actually, neither. I, I, I love it when people love it like this. And they have seen it. Uh, I don't think it, Three Idiots has done much at, uh, at the box office in Taiwan because I don't it think did. it was officially released. I think... <laughs> okay, but which one? Quickly. <laughs> yeah, so box office. Yeah. Because more, more people see it that way, yeah. Uh, okay, Sandy, how would you not want to be remembered? <laughs> not knowing what to say? Yeah, how do I not want to be remembered as somebody who doesn't know things? Who, somebody who? How doesn't know what to say? <laughs> I definitely don't want you to remember me that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. For uh, me. Miss May, if a movie was made on you, which actor would you like to play you? <laughs> come on, come on. Who would be May in the in the with the uh, bears? I don't know the actors. Actually, not too many. Uh, it should be a woman, right? Oh. Uh, you think who is the best? Yeah. At least one hundred and seventy points. Bernan last one for Abhijat. What is the one book you will save from a bonfire? Uh, to kill a mockingbird. Ooh, good one. And for Sandy, if you were to invite three people for dinner, past, present, living, etc., whom would you invite? How about this panel? Huh? Oh, huh? loving oh. it. <laughs> Brownie points there for you. <laughs> and okay. the last one. Uh, if you had, what's one superpower besides the I can power that's overpowered? One superpower that you would choose to have with you? I would end poverty. Sorry? I would end poverty. Oh. I would end poverty. Okay. Sandy, one superpower? This is for all of us. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly how I don't want to be remembered. <laughs> 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 power of storytelling. Ah, okay. <laughs> May? 
。我如果有超能力的话，我要让所有的生物，除了人类之外，都具有免于人类恐惧跟残害的复原能力。Yeah. 热情，热情，我想应该不是只有你喜欢做那件事而已，还包含遇到困难的时候、低潮的时候，你有办法挺过去，而且还能够继续爱这件事情。然后，其实这就是最困难的部分。那我觉得这个需要对自己有很强的认知，就是必须对自己要有信心。所以，我认为。在热情之余的背后，是要认识自己是谁。刚刚身体讲到的 “Who I am”， 我是谁这件事这个议题。那所以我，我因为刚刚两位都讲过了，所以我只是补充。我觉得热情的背后，其实是需要有自信心，还要有勇气的，这样事情才可以持久。Oh yeah, absolutely. I think once somebody very beautifully said that passion is not about the good times, but what pain you are willing to sustain. If you are willing to take the, the, the tough calls, if you're willing to have stamina, like May said, only then are you worthy of a passion. You're not going to become worthy of a passion if you keep saying that you want only the easy 
times. So I think all three of you have shared that so beautifully in the work you've said. Uh, the fact about passion right now actually ties in very well with the next question, Ms. May's opinions on this, because it's a, the question here is that now you found your passion, you're trying to pursue it, but everyone around you, your teachers, your parents, they're not supporting you. They tell you you can't do it. So how, would you how do you feel you should respond to that? <laughs> Uh, I, and I, I'm just sharing because a lot of ch uh, parenting is out of fear. And children are fearful, will I get a job or will I make money? You know, and I think that uh, conundrum is often why the adult will say, this is a hobby, that's a profession. So the distinction between uh, w w working with bears is a hobby, design thinking is a hobby, storytelling is a hobby, let's get a real job. So uh, just thoughts on that, quick thoughts on that. I'll start since I'm trying to I'm trying to remap my identity with the audience. Um, I'm, I love how that I'm like, but now I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to what May says by putting my headphones on. Um, um, I don't want to sound uh, because I, actually I feel like this is hard to have a quick answer, right? Because there, the quick answer um, it sounds too easy to say it, but. Um, in so many ways, all of us have struggled to hold the thing that we believe regardless of what anybody else feels for us. And um, my belief is you have to hold it regardless of what people believe and see where it takes you. And um, I know that that actually in reality can mean a lot of things for a lot of different people. That can mean losing friends or family. That can mean um, suffering. But um, I often feel like a lot of people's suffering comes from not pursuing the thing that they believe in um, and turning that part of themselves off. Uh, so, so again, I don't, I don't mean to sound quick about it, but I do think that the, um, for ourselves, seeing through all of the resistance by saying, I know that you just don't see it yet, right? that I am standing in a dark room and my job is to shine a flashlight in all of the corners so you see there's a room here and you join me in that room. And I think that our lives are about holding that flashlight, trying to light the room so that more and more people can see the spaces that we see. And I think that the best thing we can do for children is to be curious about what, you know, what lights they're starting, what corners they're starting to identify. You know, I, I, I want to just add to this. Um, uh, my husband is a uh, nine-time world billiards champion. And he had this to say about passion and uh, interest. He, uh, his idea of, of excellence does not come even with passion. He said you have to have obsession, obsession. Uh, yeah. to find excellence. Yeah. And he says this. He says often we think that it has to be interesting and entertaining and I have to find joy. He says sometimes we have to find the beauty in monotony, yeah. in doing the work every single day. Yeah. Uh, and that is not something we're willing to resolve or settle in because we want to be entertained every single day. We want novelty. And yeah. he says novelty comes only with understanding something deeper. Yeah. So the, the, the idea of committing to something after trying, after being in that is really the beauty in landing up every single day. Yeah to do something. I think that's something that uh, is, is worthy of, of looking at what that can be. Yeah, and maybe just one, one more little build on this. Um, I guess there's like a, like a conversation I've had in my head around some of the things that I have seen that I've felt resistance on. And actually, the idea of design in education was something that was resisted. Um, about a decade ago, when I started, I remember going to conferences like this and talking about, hey, Education is designed, we can redesign it. And literally, people threw tomatoes at me. I mean, it was like really, I mean, people fought with me about how idealistic I was being, how naive I was being, what an outsider I was, how I didn't understand. And I had this like, but I see it. And so I have to keep going because I see it. And if it turns out that I'm crazy, like maybe, like that's okay. That's the question. Am I right or am I crazy is essentially like, the thing to keep pursuing. Yeah. 
You know, this is a question on which uh, I, I, I had the occasion to think a lot about this at the time of Three Idiots. Because perhaps the most crucial scene in the entire movie is when Farhan goes to meet his father and tells him that he's not going to pursue engineering and he's going to become a wildlife photographer. <laughs> and this took uh, Raju and I uh, almost two months to write. And it was written on three continents, this, this particular scene. Uh, because we knew that our life sort of depended on it, on the success of that particular scene. And we felt so deeply about it that uh, we kept on threshing out ideas, we kept on rejecting lines and figuring out how exactly to convey that. And finally, Farhan goes to his father and says that, look, if I, I might fail as a photographer, but I'll definitely fail as an engineer. Because in my own eyes, I'll already be a failure. Because I'll be doing something which I don't want to do. You know, I mean, these are the, paraf I've paraphrased it slightly badly. But the first line was crucial, that he says that I might fail as a photographer, but I'll definitely feel, fail as an engineer. Because you've already failed, you know, you're not doing what you know uh, will make you happy. And to convey this idea strongly, we wrote those lines, that when Rancho is inspiring him to go and, not, I wouldn't say confront, but to reason with his father, he says that just think, that 50 years down the line, you will be in a hospital like this, you'll be dying on a hospital bed like this, and you'll regret that moment when you'll remember that you had the letter from that photographer in your hand, and the taxi was at the gate, and if you'd have caught it, life could have been different. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'll give you a我的研究时常在很偏远的深山 you cannot do it. So, I think to be a little bit of a so Nisanu 你说什么很重要的，但我相信在所有方面，如果你不展现你的信心，你就永远无法成为那个改变者。如果你不展现你的信心，你就永远无法成为那个改变者。如果你不展现你的信心，你就永远无法成为那个改变者。如果你不展现
I think I can safely speak on behalf of the audience when I say thank you to all of you for your time. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Sonam, I think you've been an absolutely great moderator. Uh, yes, for Sonam? Can we all have a round of applause for Sonam? Yeah. I, I, I think uh, uh, the two things that I'm taking away uh, if from May, I love the idea of stamina, I love the idea that uh, being passionate is, is about also letting the world know about who you are and the self-awareness that comes from you. Sandy, the idea of, uh, yes, you must know who you are, not be known for not having an answer. <laughs> no, but the idea that you've, you've kind of shared with the audience to say, understand that you're a designer and understand that as teachers, we're not just teachers. The idea that we can go in and, and find the stories uh, and, and actually understand that the locus of control resides within us to make something better. Otherwise, that sense of helplessness that comes, or oh, it's the principal or the government, will always defer the promise that we do with our children. And Abhijat, the idea of storytelling, the idea of um, finding, you know, that how that suffocation is, is something you're telling us that as, as, as in, in education and in school, uh, no child should ever have that memory. No child should get, walk out of an education program feeling suffocated. Because I remember walking in, into my design college when I was 17 and thinking for the first time I was breathing. I was breathing and saying, oh God, this is what it feels like. That when somebody listens to you, not because they have to, but they want to and they look at you in the eye and they recognize you have a story was for me such a, an awakening for what uh, education can look and feel like. And I think that promises to a child even at seven. So from the three idiots, I, I think um, it's been a, a really, really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for, for being with us. And from the audience, I think if we can give them a big round of applause. I think we're setting the tone for the rest of the two days. And uh, yeah, um, Kate, any final comments for you to make before we kind of wrap it up? <laughs> Photo opportunity always. Okay, have we, have we got anybody having one last most compelling question that we've not asked that by the time the photographer comes, if anybody wants to ask that one, that last question, Anybody? No, I don't want to look at the iPad. I want to look at the audience. No? Does everybody want to do a dance? Yeah. There, there, I see a yeah. I see a dance. Yes, there, there was one. Madhu, Madhu, yes. Let us end with Madhu. Madhu for everybody is our Design for Change Singapore partner. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know they, they are good teachers when you look back, and they're also bad teachers. Bad teachers you hated in school. But when you grow up, I look back, and I sometimes think, oh my God, if I didn't have that bad teacher, I wouldn't be who I am today. So have you had a bad teacher and you felt, I'm glad she was there in my life? <laughs> Are you sure the suffocation made you back to Yeah, place? yeah. So, Somebody in particular. A bad experience. You all can't be good. a bad experience. Okay. Uh, the bad experience was the one that I mentioned where I wrote a movie, the, my first film, Kareeb, and it flopped terribly. And I knew that I was the reason that that movie flopped. <clears throat> I was 24 years. <clears throat> old and I, <clears throat> I was already corrupted. I had made a choice. I, when I heard the story, I thought that uh, I don't think I'll be able to write a good film out of this. But I felt that the director was someone from whom I wanted to learn. There were great technicians involved, uh, a great editor, uh, Renu Saluja, a great cinematographer. Uh, and th these were stalwarts. And I thought that, you know, a movie will come out and, uh, you know, it will make me famous, etc., etc. Terrible, terrible things. You know, all these terrible ideas. Uh, I did not understand the simple truth that there should be only one reason to write a movie. 
and that should be that the story should excite you you know so from that point onwards that experience taught me and for this there are three commandments that i have followed uh, in my subsequent life so this was almost 20 years ago that i failed terribly with that film subsequent to that there are three things that i have remembered and these are three commandments of inbak bergman he said the first thing that you must remember <coughs> you will entertain because that is your job as a writer or a director that the audience is giving you undivided attention they are parking their car somewhere they are coming to a dark theater and they are watching the screen for 3 hours it's your job to entertain them second thing you must not sell your soul when you entertain that's a difficult commandment because the temptation is to just go for some more jokes some more extra things which will so called entertain them but what are your concerns as a citizen what are your values they have to be reflected in the movie that you're writing so that's the second commandment that you will not sell your soul while you entertain and the third commandment is you will write each film as if it is your last film i see so many people coming to mumbai saying that you know this one i am writing for money watch my next one but that next one never happens because you know the first one is a disaster so never write uh, for some other reason because some star has given you some dates some you know you need to build a house things like that these are the worst ideas to write why you should write a movie there should be only one reason to write a movie that the idea excites you and you should write you should be okay if after writing that you movie if you die you should be all right with that so treat each film as if it's your last film these are the three commandments that i've followed my biggest teacher has been that movie kareeb So thank you to Kiran and also all of the panelists. 我们最后就请我们今天论坛所有的语坛人一起到台下来，跟现场全场的观众一起合影留念。